Welcome back to another edition of 68 Shining Moments presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. Today, we are joined by a member of NC State's 1974 national title team, Monty Toe. Special guest today. Uh, he's single-handedly the reason I ended up putting on an NC State uniform. Uh, we, we've grown very close. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into another story. He, he's single-handedly the reason I didn't transfer after I lost a staff. So he's the reason I came back as well. So uh, I'm very excited to have him on today. I'd like to welcome uh, an NC State legend, a national champion, Monty Tao. Yeah, thank you very much, Scott. Those are such uh, nice words. And I always thank you for coming to NC State and thank you for giving me the credit. Uh, but it was really the whole ACC and we can go back to Dick Dickey recruiting me and the connections from Indiana. So just thank you for coming to NC State. You're one of the greatest shooters I've ever had the opportunity to be around. That, uh, that speaks volumes. I've been around some good ones. Yeah, so we'll, we're going to get into all those stories. So let's, let's kind of start. What was it like growing up? You went to Oak Hill High School, which is, you know, 10, 15 minutes from, from my high school. What was it like growing up in Indiana? And then kind of touch on you kind of coming through because you were a rather good baseball, football, and basketball player. Well, you, you've done your homework. And, uh, <laughs> growing up in Indiana and playing basketball kind of went hand in hand. It just seemed like, you know, that's what we did. And uh, it was a game that I fell in love with at a young age. Uh, I don't think you ever played in the old Marion Coliseum, but as a as a kid, my father used to take me to games at the Marion Coliseum and the games at Oak Hill High School. Uh, Earl Brown was the local star at, at Oak Hill at that time. He eventually went to Purdue and had a good career. And um, just, you know, just the excitement of being in a gym full of people. Uh, the atmosphere there at that time was just incredible for high school basketball. Uh, still is, I guess, to the, at this, you know, day and age, but a little bit different, a little bit different. And um just, you know, the fact that I was able to get out there and play. And I played on great high school football teams, uh, very good high school basketball teams, and very good baseball teams. I was with a competitive group uh, at Oak Hill. Some of the toughest guys that I've ever been around were guys that I played high school ball with at Oak Hill. And then we always had the Marion Giants lurking over there in the city and uh, always looking up to them. And when I was growing up, you know, they were, at the time, one of the best teams ever to play at Marion with uh, – Jerry Townsend and Joe Von Price and guys like that. So just the whole atmosphere and the excitement of playing and really just falling in love with the game. And that's what it was all about. And to this day, I love the game. You know, I don't know if I love it as much as when I was growing up and just infatuated with it and just ate it up all the time, but it's, it's been great to me. And growing up in Indiana was a great experience for me. Uh, I'm sure it was for you. You seem like a very happy young man and always uh, taking care of yourself and, uh, a good good place to grow up yeah it, it was it's definitely an easy transition uh, and I, I'm sure it was for you just to go from Indiana high school basketball to to down here where uh obviously it was growing when you came but when I was here it was just like this is where college basketball is this is the mecca the best of the best so it was it's definitely an easy transition so to kind of talk about you mentioned Dick Dickey uh I kind of got the background story on this and and it's a pretty good one uh Talk about your recruitment to state and how Dick Dickey was involved. Yeah, I feel like I feel like some things are karma. Some things happen, and in this case, um, I, I go back to Everett Case. My father used to watch Everett Case's teams play at Frankfurt High School when Everett Case was winning state championships yep. in Indiana. I think he won three or four, yep. and uh, then I play at Oak Hill High School. Uh, Dick Dickey is a good friend of Norm Sloan's. Dick Dickey lives in Marion, Indiana. Dick Dickey, uh, next to David Thompson, might be recognized as the best player ever to play at, at North Carolina State University. There's a lot of guys I can mention, but Dick's one of them. And Norm, he, Norm owed him a favor because uh, Dick had recommended John Mingelt from Elwood uh, to Norm. And uh, John was a 6'2 center, a great player, played at Auburn. And he kicked Norm's butt one night. And Norm called Dick and said, the next guy you recommend, I'm taking him no matter who it is, you know, and you're looking at him. I was next. And uh, <laughs> just all those things tied together. Dick, Dickie and Norm Sloan played for Everett Case. Yep. And then, um, you know, I'm going down there, Tim Stoddard, just a, a great uh, Indiana connection, Scott Wood. 
people like that, you know, and um, it's going to be there forever. Uh, like you said, the ACC is a great league. It's, it's a showcase league for college basketball, I think. Tobacco Road, all the great stories, great legends. And um, I'm just happy I was part of, of, a, of a great team and happy that you played so well uh, when you came down and enjoyed your time at NC State. Yeah, so let's let's kind of touch on that Indiana connection. So I've actually, now that I've graduated, I've done a lot more research. Like just looking back at, you know, your roster while you were there, you had three, maybe four, five Indiana products that were just on your team. Just kind of talk you know, how influential Indiana kind of has to kind of almost mold NC State in a way over the years. Yeah, it just seems like it's it's part of the deal, you know. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, NC State, because of Everett Case and then Norm Sloan and all the assistant coaches that go along with that, uh, recognized uh, the level of talent in Indiana. And there was always an attraction. Um, the Big Ten is the dominant league in that Midwestern area, but the ACC is kind of one of these things just kind of sits out there on a bubble. And, uh, you know, people, there's a lot of people that want to come out of the uh, Midwest and Indiana and get into that ACC. And it's, it's just something that the, the staff has always tapped into whenever I was involved as a player or a coach. And uh, just North Carolina State's a great university and it's a great attraction to a lot of kids. Yeah academically and uh, also athletically, but it was mostly athletics when you're talking to guys like you and me. You know? <laughs> yeah. So what was it, what was it like to be under coach Sloan? Obviously a guy that came from Indiana. What, what, what did he mean to you and what, it, what, what was he like as a coach? Yeah. It would take me too long to uh, tell you uh, about coach Sloan. You know, I went from, <laughs> I, I went from being a kid that, uh, you know, they really didn't want to take, you know, including coach Sloan until they started <laughs> watching me play and then um, I became you know uh, one of his favorites and uh, you know we just shared a lot of uh, you know common ideas and just the way you play the game keep it simple and try to score points he loved to <laughs> score points our teams at North Carolina State still rank as, as one of the top scoring teams ever to play in the ACC and that's without a shot clock and a, a three-point line so his philosophies, I just enjoyed being around him. You know, he didn't just talk basketball. Uh, he wasn't just a basketball coach. He was a family guy and uh, a wonderful person. Taught Sunday school uh, while he was in Raleigh. And then I was fortunate enough to come with him down to the University of Florida and work with him uh, as a coach for 10 years here. So I, I've had almost 16 years with Coach Sloan in my life. And uh, I miss him uh, daily, you know, just talking yeah. to him. And he's just a normal guy. And uh, this was always wonderful to me and has, has uh, taken care of a lot of people in his life. And uh, again, a great, great family and great, great family man. Yeah. So it sounds like Coach Sloan to you is what you are to me. That's, that's, <laughs> that's exactly what that sounds like to me. So we'll, we'll kind of move forward to the, to the national championship year. Uh, again, I, I did, I, I'm doing my research. Way more, to go. More re I should have done this a long time ago. And I would, I would have been, because I, I even called my dad who's, you know, pretty up to date on, on a lot of this, you know, stuff. And I started to really look into it. There's just a lot of like fun stuff that, you know, kind of tied in Indiana and the stuff, the things I learned about the national championship team, but you guys actually played UCLA earlier in the year and it didn't go great. How was that game? Yeah. I want to go back just a second. All right. <laughs> uh, your dad is a great basketball story in itself. All right. Uh, didn't make the Marion high school basketball team. Is that right? Yep. Got and cut all four to, years. And then went to the great, great, one of the great junior colleges in all the United States, Vincennes junior college and earned a spot there. Correct. Yes. Okay. So we got that out of the way. He's a, he was a good player too. Very good player and a great story. Great story. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but, uh, the UCLA game in December was set up by us not being able to play in the NCAA tournament the year before UCLA won the national championship and we were undefeated. So a game was set up in St. Louis uh, national TV game. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds like not much these days, but in those days you didn't, not every game was on national TV. So mm -hmm. big game, a lot of hype. We didn't play good, but <laughs> down the road, it helped us. I think when we met them again in the semifinals of the NCAA tournament, UCLA at that time was a lot like the Yankees. Uh, people get beat by the Yankees just by looking at the pinstripes and they, they keep looking at the Yankees uniform instead of who they're playing. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we had played them in uh, St. Louis in December 
of that year. And um, we, we had gotten better, we felt like, as a team as the season moved along. And they had a couple uh, chinks in their armor uh, down the stretch. In February, they lost a couple games. So things just kind of seemed to be, again, karma was working out for us. Um, at the time, we had to beat a great Maryland team. <laughs> uh, only one team went to the NCAA tournament from the ACC, and that was the conference tournament winner. And wow. Maryland might have been the second best team in the country that year, might have been the best team, except we kept beating them. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it was it was a great run for us. That December game was a was a, probably a good good warm up. Uh, you know, they, they got us got our attention for sure, and we certainly played better the, the second time around. Before we continue that interview, I just have to let you guys know that it is that time of year again. We have waited two years for this moment, and it is finally here. March's biggest tournament is back. Gonzaga's getting ready to run the table. Slippers are being fit as we speak. And our partners over at DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app, are putting our listeners at the center of the action. How? If you bet $4 on an underdog in a select game this week and that underdog wins, you win $256. That's right, $256. Here's how it works. You download the app now. You use the promo code FIELD68 when you sign up. Scroll through the list of select underdogs, bet $4 on one of them to win, and cash $256 when they do. There is no better way for you to put your college hoops knowledge to the test and then to put your money where your mouth is with DraftKings Sportsbook. It's safe. It's secure. It's reliable. You can deposit and withdraw your funds at your convenience. I know this because I use them. So remember, the code is FIELD68, that's FIELD68, to turn $4 into $256. For a limited time only, must be 21 years or older. Restrictions apply. Go to DraftKings.com for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Yeah, so you, you end up going to the, to the NCAA tournament, and you end up seeing UCLA again. Obviously, I, I mean... I think it's 64, 65, 66, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, and 73. That's the years they won national championships, correct? <laughs> what goes through your mind after you just lost the game? Obviously, you said you've gotten better over the years, but you know, obviously, you know, obviously mentally, you know, it's like you said, it's kind of that that uniform that kind of catches your eye. But if you could kind of see past it a little bit, you realize, okay, this is just another team. What well, what were you thinking, you know, now that you get another shot, you lost earlier in the year. Obviously, you guys went undefeated the year before, which is a whole nother story that we could kind of dive into where you could have won the national championship that year. What was kind of going through your mind seeing them and lining up against them in the, I think it was the, the semifinals, correct? Semifinals. And uh, the game was in Greensboro. So uh, we had that to our advantage. I mean, it, we didn't set the game up. We just showed up where they told us to show up and it happened to be Greensboro, <laughs> you know? And uh, I, I thought that helped us, but uh, I had great teammates, had great coaches. Uh, but anytime uh, you line up with David Thompson on the floor mm -hmm. and Tommy Burleson, uh, you had a chance to beat anybody that you were playing, you know, in two years, um, we lined up those guys and we played 58 games and we won 57 of them. Yeah. And uh, we just had a lot of confidence in ourselves. Uh, Coach Sloan, uh, you know, made us feel confident, said that, you know, we're the better team. We can get this done. And uh, it took some breaks here and breaks there, but that's the way basketball is. And uh, tough game all the way down, double overtime. I don't know how many NBA first round picks were on the floor, but UCLA had those on the floor plus about seven on the bench. So, yeah. you know. Uh, they, they were the, they were the Kings. And um, I don't know that we really thought about all the championships that they had won before going into uh -huh. that game. I think we just looked at that game and kept our sole attention on that game and tried to win that game. And then all of a sudden we're part of history. Yeah. Obviously they had a great player in Bill Walton who gets a lot of recognition, which is well-deserved. What was, what did your takeaway from playing against him as a player? And, and what did you guys do from a scouting report try to contain him? Yeah, I don't know if we had scouting reports in those days. Uh, Scott, we just kind of <laughs> said, Coach Stone always said, let's take care of ourselves. And uh, we'll, yeah, that will be good enough, you know. But Walton was the best player in college basketball. I think you can go back and look at AP College Player of the Year two or three years in a row. Phenomenal passer, phenomenal team player. 
uh, shot blocker, rebounder, and great fundamentals. So he had the whole package uh, just the year before or two years before he had gone 21 for 22 in a semifinal game against Memphis State. Uh, it was called <laughs> Memphis State at the time. So he, he was he was recognized as, a, as the best player in college basketball, along with David Thompson. But, uh, you know, David David's an incredible player, an incredible winner. And the combination of Burleson and, and Thompson uh, that day were just, uh, you know, good enough to get the job done. They had Keith Wilkes, a lot of other good players on their team. Yep. Walton certainly was the, was the key player. And the most intimidating figure between you and me somewhat was their coach, uh, John Wooden, over there on yep. the sideline. When you look over there, you'd almost want to take a double take and say, you know, that is John Wooden over there, you know. But – um, a great tradition, one of the best, you know, stories ever in uh, the history of team sports. And uh, fortunately, we got him that day. Yeah. Uh, John Wooden, another Indiana guy. So the, the connection's all over. There so, we go. <laughs> so obviously that that's your semifinal game. You still have another game to play after this. You, you did. You, so obviously you don't want to lay an egg. So take, take us into that Marquette, which was the Warriors then, right? Yes. So I know him as the Golden Eagles. Okay. Go, take it. Take us into that game, and you know, obviously, I'm sure the UCLA game was a little bit draining in the fact that you knew how good they were and you had to bring your best. Now you have a whole another game to win the national title. What was that game? Well, like? well, Marquette was a great team. Al McGuire, one of the great coaches of all time, and they just didn't get good yesterday. They've been good for a long, long time. Yeah, and uh, they had guys like Bo Ellis, Maurice Lucas on this team, so. Uh, what I remember as far as preparation for that game is Coach Sloan, instead of relaxing and easing off, he cranked it up a notch. and He, he made sure that we weren't going to think that we were already uh, home, you know. Yeah. We, you know, we're about third base in a baseball game. You know, we still had another uh, – we had to get to home plate. And he, he was on us pretty good, you know, preparation for the game, get ready to play. And we really played one of our better games of the year uh, as far as percentages – we turned it over a lot. I don't know if you look at that box score from the Marquette game, it's a kind of a strange box score. We turned it over, I think 23 times, but we were like 26 for 46 from the floor. We made a lot of shots and Marquette got more shots than we did, turned it over less, but we beat them by 12. It was a, it was kind of in the second half. We walked away with that game. So a great performance uh, again by that team uh, getting off the uh, cloud of beating UCLA on a, I think it was a Saturday and then turning around and, and beating a real good Marquette, great coach Al McGuire on Monday. So what, after you win the national title, what's the first thing that goes through your mind? The buzzer hits. What was the first thing that you were thinking of? <laughs> I don't know. Just couldn't believe it. You know, I, as a kid, you, you grow up watching Texas Western beat Kentucky on TV, yeah. dribble basketball outside in Converse when the snow's on the ground, and then you end up playing on a national championship team. So the feeling, you know, to this day uh, is just – one that you can't uh, duplicate, uh, just what it meant at the time, what it means now, uh, the great people that I've met along the way and the teammates uh, that I had to share it with and to this day still stay in touch with and the relationships are, are really important and that's what we maintain to this day. But the national championship, I'm sure, you know, it always, when you win, it always brings you a little bit closer together and certainly to share a national championship yeah. with a bunch of guys and a university and just all the people involved at North Carolina State. Uh, to this day, you know, just I'm real proud of what, what we were able to do. Yeah. So uh, a lot of Wolfpack fans would be mad at me if I didn't, if I didn't bring up David Thompson. Kind of talk about him and how just great of a player he was. Yeah. Best ever in the ACC. Uh, yep. That, that kind of says it all right there. There's been some <laughs> great ones. And uh, a great person, uh, very humble, uh, great competitor, loved to win. And uh, people didn't know how good a shooter that David is or was. Uh, I've coached you and some guys that could really shoot, but I put David right in there uh, with guys that could shoot the basketball because of his athletic ability and his ability to, to leap and block shots and uh, couldn't dunk, but alley-oop at that time. Uh, what was lost in his uh, great basketball ability, in my opinion, was his ability to shoot the basketball. Mm -hmm. And um, just a great teammate. I, I played six years. I was his teammate, four years in North Carolina State, and then two years in Denver. And to this day, remains one of my greatest friends and just love him to death. And 
uh, you know, just has been a great influence on my life and just a super special person. Yeah. Do you have one moment that sticks out that this is the best DT moment that I remember of him? Do you have one moment that sticks out? Well, I don't know. In a game, uh, you know, in the summertime, we played so much basketball. I, I'm, I'm sure you did too, but we did the tours like in the summer camps. We'd go to Gardner Webb and John Lucas would be there and Bobby Jones, Citadel down at Les Robinson's camp uh, mm -hmm. down at the Citadel. And uh, sometimes the greatest things that I've ever seen him do have been in those games like at midnight, going against great competition and breaking backboards and shattering <laughs> stuff, uh, just watching people run out from under the rim. But, uh, you know, the, the moment that we shared with him, a lot of people are aware of is the moment in the Eastern Regional where he blocked a shot and then flipped over Phil Spence's shoulder. And, uh, you know, nobody was, was sure what was going to happen at that time. So a real special moment for him to come back into that arena, one of the special moments ever in Reynolds Coliseum. And um, just shared so many great memories with him and watching him block shots and so gracefully go up and catch the ball and lay it in the basket. You couldn't dunk. They, they uh, at the time, Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, they took the rule dunking out of basketball during that time for some reason. Uh, so it was uh, almost more graceful to watch him catch the ball and lay it in instead of just flush it, you know? So yeah. just, uh, all those moments that we've had to share over the history, uh, the ABA slam dunk contest out in Denver, where uh, it was he and Dr. J going head to head in the first ever uh, real slam dunk contest. And uh, David missed an easy dunk or he might've won that thing. Doc deserved it. Just had a lot of special moments with David. And again, uh, a special person, very humble and uh, very God fearing, uh, you know, has a lot of respect for everything that goes on and uh, uh -huh. great family guy as well. Great family guy as well. So I don't know if you've ever seen the movie semi-pro or semi-pro with, with Will Ferrell. Uh, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of our younger generation that probably watches that movie now think that Will Ferrell and semi-pro invented the alley-oop. <laughs> but I'm actually, we're witnessing right now the guy on the camera that invented the alley-oop. Is that not right? I don't know. They give, they give us a lot of credit for it. And uh, <laughs> David deserves all the credit. Stoddard made the pass as much as I did, probably. And, uh, but it was something where David and I had the timing worked out. I had the ball in my hands a lot because I was a point guard or I was a guard. And uh, the story on that deal is when David got to North Carolina State as a freshman, people couldn't stop him once he got the ball. He, they couldn't stop him. So good players he was playing against, guys older, freshmen, juniors, seniors, varsity guys, uh, they got up and started denying him the ball at the top of the key when he came up to get the ball. He always liked to get it right in the middle of the floor. He could go either way. And uh, he went back door one day, and I threw a pass that went up there, and he went up and laid it in, and that just seemed to start the whole deal. And that was his freshman over in Carmichael Gym, Reynolds Coliseum, uh, one of those places. And uh, just to this day, it's one of the prettiest plays in basketball. I remember the alley-oop from John Brody uh, being the quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers and throwing it to R.C. Owens uh, in the end zone. That, that would date me as, a, as an NFL fan a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> I, I'm giving you all the credit. It, it's not. Well, thank you. It's not uh, Will Ferrell. David, David, David should have, uh, he should have got that thing and gotten all the royalties for it. I don't know who's got alleyoop.com or alleyoop, but David <laughs> should have it. Uh, there's no question about it. That's for sure. That's for sure. So uh, I'm going to give, so I got a really good story. Uh, I mean, there's, there's plenty. So it, it's the Wolfpack Club golf course, right? Is that, is that where it's at? The faculty club. Fal faculty club. All right. So. Coach Tao hits me up one day and he says, why don't you, why don't you come out here and we'll play golf? And I've, I'd never been there. I didn't know anything about it. He just told me it's a, it's a, it's a little nine hole course. And I, I, I bring all my clubs. I brought, I brought my whole bag. Um, and if you've never played there before, you, you literally maybe need a wedge yeah. and a putter. Yeah. Sand wedge maybe too, but wedge, wedge and a putter will do it. Yeah, so it's it's just a small par three course, and and I come with my whole bag, and, and Coach Tao's kind of looking at me like, what are, you, "What are you doing? Like you, you need maybe three clubs max. What are you doing?" And I'm like, "What? I'm trying to win here. Like I, if I need my clubs, I need my clubs, and plus I had never played there, so uh, I, I look at him and I'm like, "Where are your clubs?" And he lifts up his club, one club. He brings a putter, <laughs> a putter, 
is all he brought. And we played nine holes, and you absolutely kill me with a putter. And oh, I have good. My, That's a good story. And I had my entire bag, and all you played with is, is a putter. That's a good story. <laughs> That's a good story. I remember that, and uh, there was a lot of things going on that day. And, uh, you know, I'm just glad I had a chance to play golf with you then. And uh, also, uh, you know, at the university club, uh, not the uh, but the, the main course now. Uh, yeah, Lonnie Poole. Lonnie Poole. And uh, have been out there with you. And you've got a future in golf. I don't know what you're doing these days. But uh, <laughs> yeah, don't tell that, anybody that story too much about me beating you the putter. or uh, Nobody will let you play with it, you know? Well, that that's all right. The, the same thing happened to my dad. Uh, he, he comes on campus and you ask him to go play tennis in the morning. And my dad played uh, high school tennis and wasn't bad. And he, he comes back and you guys played it like 5.30 in the morning or 6 in the morning, <laughs> something, something early. So by the time I wake up, he's coming back. And he says, I asked him, I said, how'd you do? He said, he absolutely killed me. <laughs> <laughs> so how tall are you really? Five, seven. Okay. Uh, five, seven. You won't find a more competitive five foot seven person or six, nine person or seven foot person than the person that I'm looking at right now. It didn't matter what we were doing. Hands down the most competitive, whether he's got a putter, a tennis racket, whether we're playing cards, hands down the most competitive person I've ever met. And I, I consider myself very competitive. So you are, you are. And uh, that's a nice thing you say, you know, uh, sometimes it gets in my way <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> you know, but for the most part, it's been um, the area where I had, I felt like I had a little bit of an advantage over some other guys, like for whatever reason, even in high school, it meant a lot to me to win more than anything else. I really wasn't worried about stats. I, I knew, I knew what my stats were, but um, you know, just to win was always something for whatever reason was something that that's why you're supposed to be trying to trying to do it. You're not going to win every time, but you certainly try to win. Certainly try to win. Yeah. So I had Lorenzo on my last, last week. Um, and he, he brought up this story of when I think we're blaming CJ Leslie. We, we really don't know who it was, but I think we were late. <laughs> we were late to uh, study halls and we get a message saying, meet at the intramural mural field at 6 a.m., 5.30, whatever it may be. And we ended up rolling, rolling down and rolling back. And I, I, I was hesitant with Lorenzo to admit it, but I had more, I had so much fun <laughs> it, I had so, like it was so much fun. Everybody else is getting sick and throwing up, and obviously, three hours later, everybody broke out because the chemicals on the field. But I had so much fun rolling, and I was just doing it so fast, so fast, so fast. Whose idea was that? Was that Coach Lowe's? I want to know who came up with that idea. Okay, I, I've got to say that, to the best of my ability, my recall is that there was Coach Lowe, a Dematha product. And Coach Strickland, who uh, is a Dematha product, and I think there's something between Dematha and that rolling around on the ground. Uh, if you get Coach Low on the show, I think he was would be the one that might need to explain it to you. And <laughs> I think after doing that for a week or two, we were told not to do it uh, because of uh, what you just described, some situations and. Uh, <laughs> One of my favorite recalls in that was watching Javi Gonzalez uh, roll down <laughs> on the ground. Uh, I'm sure he had never experienced anything like that before. Uh, maybe rolling on the beach down in Puerto Rico, but I know he'd never done it uh, as a basketball player on the ground because somebody showed up late for a weightlifting session or, or tutoring, whatever. Oh, I, I can tell you that's one of my that's one of my great memories. I know we were in trouble, but I just remember sitting there just rolling as fast as I could, as fast as I could back, and just having. I was having fun. And then obviously three hours later when I, when I broke out in, I don't know if they're hives or whatever, <laughs> chemical, whatever they put on. That's not funny. I'm sorry. That's not funny. I'm sorry it was, that happened. I'm sorry it, that happened. It was, it was a lot of fun. So they, obviously we, we couldn't do it anymore, but that's, that's, a, that's a good memory for me during that time. I got to tell you, so the, the roughest, the roughest time for me in an NC state uniform was the day Coach Yao comes in, uh, our athletic director, and tells us we're moving on from uh, that staff. 
And I, I'm a man enough to admit that I teared up and everything because I was losing you. Obviously, Coach Lowe recruited me. What, what kind of went through your mind? Obviously, my mind, I was completely upset uh, because I, was, I, I had grown so close to you uh, in that situation. What were you thinking during that time? Yeah, I don't know that I can even remember uh, during those situations. It's hard to remember exactly what, what you're thinking. Uh, I know I felt like that we had a really good team coming back the next year, you know, yeah. and uh, we, we hadn't performed as well as we would have liked in the previous years, particularly, you know, not getting to the NCAA tournament. But we, mm. we felt like we were right there on the verge of, of really busting through, you know, yeah. and so a little bit confused, you know, I, I, I thought we were going to uh, make it through that tough period right there and, and be coaching you guys again for another year. And then when everything happened uh, the way it happened, uh, I just am scrambling for a, a career. And uh, fortunately, <laughs> I ended up with Kermit Davis uh, mm -hmm. over at Middle Tennessee. And obviously, would have loved to have, uh, you know, stayed there at North Carolina State, but it didn't work out. Uh, that's part of the business, you know, it, that happens yeah. in certain situations. But I certainly enjoyed working with Coach Lowe, and I enjoyed your relationship with Coach Lowe. I thought you guys – uh, got to know each other really well. And I, I appreciate you saying you miss me, but I think you really missed, you know, you were going you knew you were going to miss being around coach Lowe. Uh, he was getting you a lot of shots, you know, you were leading the team <laughs> minutes played and uh, everything was going pretty good. You were, you were on your way, buddy. <laughs> yeah. And that, so that brings me to, so we, I went, I went through that coaching change and I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I was, I, I mean, I had already established myself really well at NC state. I'd started every game of my career. Uh, I just didn't know what to do. I uh, put out some feelers to like Notre Dame, Butler. Uh, hey, I might be transferring. I don't know what the plan is. I just don't know what to expect. And obviously they hired Mark Godfrey. And you give me a call and you put me back in my seat. And they basically told me there's no way you're leaving NC State. And so <laughs> this is like to me, you may not even remember the call, uh, but to me that's, that meant a lot coming from someone that had established so much at NC state and for their career uh, to basically tell me like, listen, you've established so many connections, no matter who the coach is, you're going to continue to get better and grow. Raleigh's a great place for you. NC state's a great university to get your education. Uh, and looking back on it, that was, you know, a big part of my career to know, you know, it'll be okay. No matter what happens next, you're going to go on and you're going to be a great player, a great student athlete, become an even better person. And that was a big moment for me. That call that you made to me, because I was really, you know, I had probably half a leg out the door. Yeah. That, that's uh, so kind of you to say. So I recruited you twice. Is that right? Or helped basically. Yeah. 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 Coach, <laughs> Coach Godfrey and Bobby Luce, you probably. I, I, thank you. I, I knew how happy – First of all, I knew you really enjoyed NC State. That's what I knew. You know, if you yep. were unhappy there and, you know, things weren't going great. But I knew that you were going to continue to be successful no matter who the coach was because your heart was there and your soul was there and you wanted to be there just like you're sitting there right now back in Raleigh. And, yep. uh, you know, it's just – it's a situation I've been in a couple of times in my career and the advice I've always given the kids, even in recruiting, is you need to pick a school out uh, because of the school and the competition and your teammates – and the coaches might be there and they might not be there. Um, I've never had the experience of a play, as a player of going through a coaching change. Uh, coach Sloan was always my coach, Larry mm -hmm. Brown in Denver. Uh, so there was never a problem. I would think it'd be very unnerving uh, to have a coaching change during the middle of your career, particularly when you've been so successful like you had been. So give yourself credit for uh, toughing it out. You had some good teammates. You guys knew you were going to be good. And yeah. uh, just a matter of finding a guy to get in there and coach you up a little bit. And he brought in a good staff and you guys were successful and uh, you've been very successful. And so, so is everybody else. All right. I've got three questions to, to kind of end it. I asked this, these same questions to, to everybody that comes on. So you, you can have fun with these. These are pretty laid back. Okay. What is, what was your favorite place to eat on or by campus? Brothers Pizza and Red's College Grill. There's two of them. <laughs> See, that's the first time I've heard either of those. So, Well, they don't exist anymore. <laughs> but if you go back in the history of Hillsborough Street, you'll find Brothers Pizza, Jimmy Russo, and Red's College Grill with Red. Cheeseburgers at Red. Okay. 
All right, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to do my research on that. I've done a lot of research, but those are ones that I, I need to go back you know, and look at. You know where the Jolly Knave is on Hillsborough Street? I do not. Okay. I know where Hillsboro right. Street is. Does that help? Right, right below the Hillsboro, right below Jolly Knave. It's a bar restaurant owned by Mitch Hazari. Uh, right below that is a building that or a space that no longer is vibrant. There's nobody in there. I don't think. All right. yeah. And that was Fred's College Grill, right below that. Right okay. Below that. All right. I, I think I know the answer to this, but if you want to maybe go to your second favorite, what is your most memorable moment in an NC State uniform? Winning the ACC tournament against Maryland our junior year when Maryland was better than us. They just couldn't beat us because of David Thompson. <laughs> and uh, we'd beaten them five straight times. And if we didn't win that ACC tournament final game, we never would have gone to an NCAA tournament. Only one team from the ACC went to the NCAA tournament. Yeah. And Maryland played great. And Burleson played better. Burleson had 38. And we went on to win 103 to 100. And I went over after the game was over. And everybody else was out on the court celebrating. And I just went over and sat down next to Coach Sloan's wife, Joanne and cried and just the emotions we were just drained right that was before the ncaa tournament championship and that was an overtime game too correct overtime 103 to 100 some people say that is the best game ever played in the acc with all the situations involved one team goes the other goes home you know just all the things yeah great players maryland had john lucas and tom mcmillan and elmore and all those guys all right so what do you miss most about being in an nc state uniform just being around the guys and playing in the college atmosphere. We had a great time at NC State. It was like a, a you know, paradise, you know, when we yeah. were there. It was so much fun. And uh, the student body enjoyed, you know, our success. People would sit out the night before the game and, you know, get in line for tickets. Just the whole atmosphere going through the ACC. I miss all that, you know. It was, it was something that you kind of like a, a comet, you're kind of shooting through space and you get a chance to taste that for three or four years and then your college career is over. But I can't think of anybody that enjoyed their college life and career uh, more than me at North Carolina State and in, in Raleigh. Uh, when I left home Converse and drive my little Ford Maverick uh, down to Raleigh, I didn't know where I was going and I didn't know whether I was going to play baseball or basketball, really. But uh, yeah. it, tur it turned out to be uh, as good a four years as I've ever had in my life. Then I've coached there couple of times so just the whole feeling of being around the nc state people and the fans and the excitement it, it's been a great run great great ride for me and a, a great journey yeah so uh i don't know if you saw so elliot avent had an interview last night and he was basically thanking all the reporters and i, I don't know if i could one up what he <laughs> did uh but but to close out i, I to me personally i just want to say thank you uh because there's a lot of people that have, have influenced me during my time at NC State. Uh, I don't know if any of them would be more than, than you and what you did for me, obviously what you did for my family. Uh, I'm gonna get emotional talking about it, but I just wanna say thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart because you really shaped my career, uh, just being the person you were making me become a better person uh, as well as a basketball player. So uh, I, I got to say thank you for that. Well, you're welcome, but thank you. <laughs> I, I wish I could take credit for any of that because it's you that's really done all that. But I, I'll, I'll go ahead and say thank you and accept it. You come from a great family. You're a great kid. And obviously you're doing really well and you just keep it up. I don't know about your future in the podcast business, but uh, <laughs> hopefully you're doing well in that too. I think you're right where you belong in your life. You know, I've told you that before there in Raleigh, being around people and just being, being there. So good luck with all that. And thank you for those kind words. You, you were great uh, to work with. I've known you for a long time, known your family and known those Marion giants and how tough they are. And uh, <laughs> the guy we didn't mention, you know, Julius Mays was your teammate. He came yep. down here too and love Julius as well. And he's, he's doing well now and just hope that uh, your teammates and all those guys that played with you, uh, they were good guys. I hope they're all doing well. Yep. Yep. For sure. So uh, again, everybody that tunes in Wolfpack nation, thank you. Uh, like subscribe, do all the stuff that, you know, I don't really understand, but we, we got to say it anyway. Uh, thank you, Coach Tao, for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, and go Pack.